If you've been subscribed to the channel for a while now, then you know that I've been on a journey to smartify my new house. As part of the renovations, we got a new kitchen installed, and that gave me the perfect opportunity to design the lighting for it. Obviously, I wanted smart lights, ones that would work with Home Assistant, my home automation platform. I really love cooking, and spend a lot of time preparing meals here, so I wanted to make sure that the lights underneath the top cabinets were super bright, and had a cool white colour. This makes it easier to see what I'm doing, so that I'm less likely to chop my fingers off. But I definitely didn't want cool white light at the tops of the cupboards. I wanted these lights to more closely match the warm white lights that I use around the rest of my house for accent lighting. And because I'm a massive nerd, I also wanted the lights to be able to change colour, in case I wanted to turn the kitchen into a discotheque. And I find that coloured lights like this work really well for passive notifications, telling me visually if someone's at the front door, or if the washing machine has finished its cycle in the laundry. LED strips seem to make the most sense for this because of their form factor. It's well suited for long runs of lights that need to be discreetly mounted without hot or cool spots. But which LED strip should I use? How am I going to mount them into place? How will I get the cabling in there and hide it from day to day view? How will I get around the problem with LED strips getting dimmer towards the end when you have long runs of them? What lighting automations make the most sense in a kitchen? To find out, stay tuned. After a lot of research, which basically meant watching Dr. Z, The Hookup, and Quindor's YouTube channels, I came away with the conclusion that the SK6812 LED strips would be ideally suited for my kitchen lights. Why? Well, a number of reasons. Firstly, these light strips have separate white and RGB LEDs on them. As I mentioned, light brightness and the colour of the white light was really important to me for this use case. Having separate white and RGB channels means that I can make the white light much brighter and clearer than some of the other LED strips out there that try to make a white light out of red, green, and blue LEDs. The SK6812 strips also come in three different white light colours. There's cool white, natural white, and warm white. I planned on buying the cool white version for underneath my top cabinets, and the warm white version for the tops of the cabinets and cupboards. I also like the fact that these were 5 volt strips. This low voltage made it much safer for a noob like me to be playing around with the wiring, as it's pretty much impossible to push enough current through 5 volts to start any fires or melt wires. Unfortunately though, 5 volt LED strips are more prone to getting dimmer as the length of the strip increases, because the lower voltage makes it harder to push the current down the wires, and you end up suffering from something called voltage drop. But there are ways around that, and I'll explain that issue and the solution to it later in this video. Another reason for choosing the SK6812 light strips is because of the density of the LEDs on them. I was able to get them in a 60 LEDs per meter configuration, unlike some of the other LED strips which only have 30 LEDs per meter. The more LEDs you have per meter, the more even the light looks, and you don't end up seeing hot and cool spots in your lighting. You can get more LEDs per meter as well, but that just means you need more power, which means buying a bigger power supply, and the whole thing gets more complex and expensive. These LED strips are also individually addressable, which means you can control each single LED on the strip individually, allowing you to make really complex patterns and lighting sequences if you so wish. These SK6812 strips are fully compatible with the open source WLED controller software, which is my new favourite way to control LED strips like this. WLED runs on ESP devices, and a really smart fella called Quindor has created these ESP-based WLED controllers, which makes setting up these lights a breeze. If you're not familiar with WLED or Quindor's controllers, you should check out a previous video that I made that explains the basics of this WLED software and how it all works. For this project, I'm going to be using a couple of different Quinlead controllers. Firstly, a Dig Uno controller board to manage the lights underneath the top cabinet which is the same kind that I used in that previous video. And I'm going to be using its bigger brother, the Dig Quad, which is essentially the same thing, but capable of pushing far more power, something we're going to need with these longer runs of LED strips. In addition to the LED strips and the controller boards, I needed a 5 volt power supply that was capable of powering these LEDs at a pretty decent brightness level. The power supply was going to be placed on top of the cabinets, out of reach of any hands or anything that could interfere with them. This meant that I was able to use a cage style power supply like this, which is a little bit gnarly as it has exposed 220 volt terminals that could short out or electrocute someone if something comes across the live and neutral terminals. The power supply though has short circuit protection, over voltage protection, and my house is protected by circuit breakers and RCDs, so hopefully this is fine? 
When we were having the kitchen installed, I had my electricians wire 220 volt supply cables to the tops and underneath all of the kitchen cabinets. There are some underneath the kitchen island cabinets too, just in case I want to wire something up there in the future. The cables have these blue connectors on the end, which are a safe way for me to connect and disconnect the power supplies if I want to unplug them to work on them above the kitchen cabinets. I also had the electrician run some three core flex cable from the top of the cabinets to underneath and all the way to the floor behind the cupboards, which I could connect my 5 volt positive, ground and LED data wires to in order to create really long runs of LED strips both above and below the cabinets and along the floor level. So now that I had all of my pieces, it was time to measure each section of the LED strips out, cut them to size and solder tail wires to the end of each section. I'd then place these sections into these aluminium channels, which I'd then mount to the undersides and the tops of all the cabinets. Conveniently, my dad happened to be in town, and he's a retired electrical engineer. He not only helped me with the design of this whole solution, but I put him to work with the soldering iron to solder the small tails of red, black and green wires onto the positive ground and data channels on each of the ends of the LED strips. He's much better at soldering than I am, he's had years of practice. To protect the solder joints, we added a little bit of heat shrink to each end and then tinned the end of the exposed wires so we could easily connect them up to each other using these Wago connectors. I had the job of wiring up the power supply to the two Quin LED controllers, the smaller controller for the under cabinet lights and the larger one for the top lights as it was a longer run. I had originally wanted to use the Dig Quad to control both the top and the bottom lights with one controller, but I couldn't figure out how segments worked in WLED and how to turn them on and off individually. I gave up after about an hour of messing around because I wanted to get my lights finished while my dad was still in town. If anyone has a good tutorial on how to do that, then please let me know in the comments below. I started with the lights underneath the cabinets first, as they were the smaller of the two runs. I first laid out the light strips on the bench tops and wired them in to make sure they worked. I then stuck them into the aluminium channels and attached them to the underside of the cabinets using double sided tape. To hop across this gap where the extractor fan is, I drilled a small hole into the bottom of the cabinet and fed some flex cabling through to the other side and then connected the next sets of lights to that. The cable from the controller drops through a void behind the kitchen cabinet in this corner here. One of the annoying things about these digital LED strips is that you need to connect the data cable to the start of the light strip, which was way over there in the opposite corner. I ended up using a hot glue gun to stick some thin low voltage cabling into the aluminium channel and connected it to the start of the strip with some more Wego connectors. With them all mounted into place, I turned them on and then noticed that the lights at the start of the run seemed to be much brighter than those at the end of the run. I was running into that pesky problem called voltage drop. Voltage drop is unfortunately a problem with the laws of physics. As electricity passes through wires, it encounters resistance, which slows it down and lowers the voltage. The longer an electrical wire is, the more resistance that there is, and the lower the voltage gets as you get further along the wires. The thinner the wires are, the more resistance they create. A big fat copper wire can let electricity through far better than a thin copper wire. LED strips have really thin copper sections inside them for the electricity to pass through, and this exacerbates the problem. Lower voltage light strips, like these 5 volt ones, suffer more noticeably from voltage drop than a 12 volt strip because the starting voltage is lower and the lights are therefore more susceptible to the changes. You can solve this however by injecting power directly from the power source via fatter wires into regular points along the LED strip. This basically tops up the electricity in the strip and keeps the voltage at a higher level. This is a dramatic oversimplification of Ohm's law and I'm sure there are people watching this video itching to correct me in the comments. Old mate from the YouTube channel The Hookup used to be a high school science teacher and he has a really great video about LED strips and voltage drop. He has a wonderful analogy about cows and a feeding trough that explains the whole thing way better than I just did and I encourage you to go watch his video and subscribe to his channel if you need more information. Luckily I had anticipated that this would be a problem and I had glued more low voltage cabling into the rest of the aluminium channels allowing me to inject extra 5 volt power into the start and end of each LED strip section. With this extra power connected, I fired up the lights one more time and they looked so much brighter and more even. I was feeling pretty good and cocky at this point, so I decided to just go ahead and wire up the top lights directly on top of the cabinets for the first time without even testing them. I rested the aluminium channels on top of the cupboards and held them into place with little balls of blue tack to stop them sliding around. With all the cables connected, it was time to fire them up. Okay, here we go. Oh.
fuck's sake. Unfortunately, it seems that only the first section of lights were working and the rest were mysteriously dark. By using a multimeter to measure the voltages and connecting and disconnecting different lighting sections to isolate them from each other, we eventually figured out that Dad had done a dodgy soldering job on one of the data lines. What a wally. He kindly redid the soldering joint, we wired it back up. Let's try that again. Yes! And it worked. We had the same voltage drop problem as before, with the end of the LED strip being much dimmer than the start. But once again, we'd anticipated this, and we were able to run extra flex cabling from the other Dig Quad 5V positive terminals to each end of the LED strips, which solved the problem instantly. As this was on top of the cabinet, I didn't bother with gluing any wires, I could just messily lay them across the top of the cabinets and no one would ever see them. The advantage of the Dig Quad controller is that it has multiple power terminals, each with their own fuse, making it a safe way to distribute lots of power injection points into your LED strip. The QuinLED website has lots of wiring diagrams explaining how to do this properly, and it's a really handy resource. The lights were still not that bright, however, and it turns out that was because I had this automatic brightness limiter set inside the WLED software. This setting can be found under the configuration menu, in LED preferences, and lets you limit the amount of current that the board supplies to the LED strip so that you don't blow up your power supply or melt any cables. I decided to turn this feature off entirely, something that my dad firmly told me was a silly idea, and I immediately blew one of the fuses on the Quinn LED controller. Luckily, I was able to borrow another fuse from another controller, and I put it back together and set the limit down to 6 amps. I then slowly increased the value until I thought that the light looked bright enough. This was about 10 amps in my setup, but will vary wildly depending on what LED strips you're using and how long your total light strip is. I'm actually really happy with how this turned out in the end. The lights look like they were installed by a professional kitchen lighting expert. I had some warm LED strip left over, and a spare DiGuno board as well, so I replicated the whole thing here on top of this other cupboard just for good measure. So why did I bother with all of this complexity when I could have just stuck some normal boring LEDs to the cupboards like every other person who has a kitchen installed? Well, my lights integrate perfectly with Home Assistant, and that means that I can accurately control them with scenes and automations. The first thing I did was create three home assistant scenes for the kitchen and dining area. The first one was for cooking, which makes the lights really bright and white, and this is what comes on most of the time by default. I then created a dining scene, which we turn on when we're done preparing dinner and are sitting down to eat. This creates some really nice mood lighting, and turns on a specific colour scheme and pattern under the kitchen cabinets, giving off vibes of a fireplace or the aurora borealis. And then finally, there's the dim nightlight scene, which is what we turn on late at night when we don't want the blinding white kitchen lights coming on. These scenes can all be activated via the voice assistant in the corner, this home assistant wall panel near the dining table, the hue dimmer switch here, or from our mobile phones. The scenes are also turned on automatically as part of our motion activated lights automations, when motion is detected by the kitchen motion sensors and automation is triggered. A condition then checks to make sure that evening mode is on, which is a mode that my house goes into when the light levels inside or outside go below a certain level, and then another condition checks to make sure that the lights are actually switched off. We don't want the lights to go from dim to bright if motion is suddenly detected. If those conditions pass, it then runs one of two actions. If it's after 10pm but before 7am, it activates that dim scene I was talking about earlier with that nice low night lighting. If it's any other time of day, it will activate my bright cooking scene. I've got a few other automations configured for these lights as well, and they give us visual notifications about things that are going on in our house. The top of this cupboard flashes red and blue for 5 seconds when someone's detected at our front door. This automation is triggered when the front doorbell detects a person. The automation then uses the scene create service to create a dynamic scene which records the settings of both of the WLED light strips on the top of the cupboards. It then calls the light turn on service to set the coat cupboard light to the police mode, which is what makes it flash red and blue. And then, after 5 seconds, it reapplies the dynamic scene that we created earlier to put the lights back to where they were before. This is a really handy automation for us to know if there's someone at the door, if we're having a party, or just generally sitting down at dinner. I also have a few other similar automations that call different kinds of effects and colours for other things that happen around the house. For example, the light flashes green if the washing machine or dryer are finished with their cycles and remain unemptied, and it sparkles in a nice blue way when rain is detected outside. 
These helpful light cues are far less intrusive than an audio message from a smart speaker and won't wake anyone up. You could easily repurpose these same automations to flash a light if your child's bedroom door opens after they've gone to bed, or when a timer is up and your cookies need to be taken out of the oven. But did I really need to install complicated WLED lights into my kitchen? No, definitely not. I could have easily used any bog-standard smart LED strip from Philips Hue or Govi and achieved almost the same outcome. But I'm a massive nerd, and this was a fun home automation project that I could get stuck into. When we bought our house, it was exactly this kind of project that I look forward to the most, and getting the opportunity to learn new things while solving problems is exactly the kind of thing that makes me happy, especially when I get to do it with my dad. But now I have a blank canvas of individually addressable LED strips in my kitchen, and I have plans for a whole load more automations and projects that are going to use them. One goal that I have is to make the lights change to a blue or green color when we're generating a lot of solar power, in order to encourage us to run the dishwasher or the washing machine at times when it makes the most economical and environmental sense. The lights can then fade to orange or red when we're consuming a lot of power to encourage us to turn things off and reduce our usage when we're importing power from the grid. Do you have any cool suggestions on things like this that I could do with these lights? Let me know in the comments below. And whilst you're down there, if you found this video helpful, I'd really appreciate a donation to the channel via a super thanks or the PayPal donation link. These donations help me keep the channel going and help me convince my partner that making videos is a sensible way to spend my time. If a donation is too much, which I totally understand, then I'd really appreciate you clicking the thumbs up button and subscribing to the channel. I regularly create videos like this about smart home projects and home automations. By subscribing to the channel, you'll see when I've uploaded any new videos and then together we can make your home smarter.